Good evening, everyone. How you doing? Woohoo! It feels a little bit like a rock show here. I got a like huge crowd. Did you know you were this popular down under? Like, wow. No idea. No idea. <laughs> you guys are all here for the right thing, right? Like, there's no, it's not like Lady Gaga down the street or anything. <laughs> Sorry. Do <laughs> no, yeah. Good luck. It's a tech event. You know that, right? Um, evening, everyone. My name is Jane Scowcroft, and I'm going to be your host for the evening. Um, I'm currently uh, head of product at Data61. Sorry, Data61, but I will, I'm proud to announce that I'm going to be joining Antler uh, at the beginning of May as a venture partner. So very exciting news. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of a preamble, but don't worry. Then I'm going to shut up, and we're going to hear from the man of the hour, um, and we're going to dive into some really interesting, meaty topics. Um, this is a fireside chat, so I encourage you to get nice, cozy. Obviously, it's pretty warm in here, so we've covered off that basis, no worry. Um, but get nice and close to your neighbor. There's, we've got a couple of seats, so make sure you're squeezing in. Um, so welcome to the City of Sydney Visiting Entrepreneurs Program. Uh, we're tackling the topic of scaling startups. But you guys are in luck, because we're going to go into a whole bunch of other areas as well. Um, and we'll have some time for questions at the end, too. So please make sure you're capturing all your really bright ideas um, to share with us as well. Um, first, uh, you know, I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal uh, peoples of the Aura Nation, uh, recognizing their elders past, present, and emerging in the land on where we're meeting today. Um, this event has been held at uh, City, uh, City of Sydney, Tech Sydney, Antler, and Fishburner. It's a great location we're here uh, in as well. So just a big round of applause to those guys for supporting the ecosystem. That's a really important part, uh, the really important role that all of those players uh, uh, involved in with bringing everyone together, creating this great space, bringing great speakers, um, and it's fabulous to see the tech community in Sydney and Australia growing, becoming stronger, day over day, year over year. Uh, very phenomenal to see. Um, uh, a little bit about Antler before we just kick off. So Antler is a new market entrant in the uh, Australian space um, and is tackling, oh, sorry, is tackling a, a different part of the market. You know, it's, it's, it's an unlocking potential in, poten in co-founders, in finding those teams, um, providing access to capital, providing the access to the commitment um, and that time investment to really create phenomenal companies. It's, it's early stage startup, it's VC investment, but it's looking at making a, creating a healthier pipeline in the Australian ecosystem, which is a really, which is a need uh, that we're experiencing, a need that we're seeing, uh, and very excited to see the success that's going through. We've got a couple of the early uh, applicants for the cohort tonight, so if you're wandering around and chatting, actually, I'll get you to put up your hands, those that, those that are part of the cohort. Um, we haven't, yep, we've got some around the back. They've, they've given up their seats for you, which is really, really nice. Um, so do ask some questions towards the end um, and, and uh, ask them about the program, ask them about what incentivize them. And also all the folks wearing black uh, antler, black shirts with antler on it, go say hi to them and ask them lots of questions. Um, so we're going to dive into our fireside chat. We do have um, a Slido link, if we can get that up, because there will be some time for questions from you guys later on. And so I encourage you... It's, yeah, eventually, yeah. Great. It will be coming. Um, and so we'll take some questions from Slido, but also questions from the audience. Um, so make sure you're, you're uh, messaging your questions to the Slido link and then upvoting the democratic broom here. So we want to make sure we respect that. Um, so Andreas, really excited to have you here tonight with us. Um, I'm sure I probably don't need to read his bio because you're all here for, I assume, not to see me. Um, but I will sort of go over a bit of his, his overview anyway. So he's a board member, investor in a number of uh, various companies and frequently hired as an advisor for promising startups, so growing startups, um, venture capital funds and other corporates. So he was Spotify's first employee and first CTO, um, growing the team there. I'm really excited to dive into some of the, the experience and the background, background there. Uh, and before Spotify, he worked for Swedish online gaming company uh, and was co-founder of Rap. So he's passionate about building companies, thoughtful about the technology, understands that growth journey that people go through um, and the tension points along that, along that pathway and really excited to dive into some of those topics as well. Um, so before, uh, as we dive in, Andreas, I'm really excited to hear 
um, from you a little bit about your origin story. So where you came from, where that initial passion for technology really started. Sure, thank you. Um, awesome to see this crowd here tonight. So many people showed up. Um, so I'm originally from Stockholm, Sweden, up in the north. Uh, I would say almost probably literally on the other side of the planet from where we are now. Um, so it's exciting to be here in Sydney. And I, I guess um, I, I've been interested in you know how, how nature works, how technology works, how mathematics works and how machines works as long as I can remember it. So it's, it's, that's always been a passion that's there. It's, um, you know, taking, uh, it, it's worked in different ways. I mean, my, my probably original most, the, the original like technical interest that, that, that flourished first of all with chemistry. So eventually, eventually I got into computers. Uh, it's uh, one of those fields that like almost magically you can do anything with nothing. Like, as long as you have access to some sort of computer hardware, you can take that anywhere. And there's almost no other field where, where that's the case. Um, you know, in my case, I was super interested in chemistry, but at some point you kind of run out of a budget for a kitchen lab and there's like only so far you can go. And you Talk know, about a fireside chat, did right? you blow anything up? <laughs> oh, literally, it was a lot of, a lot of burning accidents, yeah. Um, and, and you know, with computers, there's just no limit. I mean, in, in principle, you don't even need the hardware. You could just do computer science with pen and paper. It's applied math. Um, so that's uh, it's an interesting field. It's, it's also you know you kind of see that when when you later start studying the subject um, on on the university levels. I went to the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, studied computer science, and there too you'd see people that are literally starting um, a college education with uh, you know. 20 years of, uh, 15 years of like work experience, hands on, right? And you don't, you don't really see that in any other field. Um, so that's that's like a cool thing about our, our industry. People people have been doing this from like as long as they've been able to speak, basically. Um, that's great. So that idea you can create something out of nothing. You have the barrier to entry is so low that it's accessible to so many different players and so many different people across the ecosystem. I think that's. And unlocking that and, and capturing that is really, really powerful. Do you remember what your first program was that you wrote? Um, it was like a menu system to use to access other games. <laughs> written, written in basic. Nice, very yeah. good. There's a, there's a Dutch uh, computer scientist, uh, his name's Dijkstra, I think he said it at one point that, uh, you know, about his students, um, that anyone who kind of learned programming in basic was had his mind destroyed forever, so I hope, hope that's not true. <laughs> I feel like you seem to be doing okay, so <laughs> maybe you're the exception to the rule. Um, so so la later, later, and I guess topics that are more interesting than this is like, um, so towards the, end of, towards the end of that education in, in L5 was when I first kind of got in touch with the real um, computer industry. So I was in, in San Jose in California working for a company called BA Systems, um, writing my master thesis, um, which eventually would never get handed in and like probably still sits on a, some laptop hard drive that's probably crashed by now. So I was back in Stockholm and uh, dropped out of college almost on the finishing line and joined a startup instead. I think that's a pretty common story too, yeah. So it, it, good that you were successful or otherwise you might have to go back and do that masters. <laughs> um, so so that, uh, that passion, that initial, initial drive, that creation, is that still what motivates you today, or how has that passion evolved over time, over your career? I would say, I would say it's still there. Um, I mean, now, now I spend most of my time more on the investing side than the building side. Um, but the, the interest in, you know, what's, what's next, um, where do we go from here, is, is, is there the same way. That's phenomenal. So you mentioned um, masters almost through to the finish line. Talk me through the transitions after that. Absolutely. So, um, so the company I joined when I was back in Stockholm um, was called Stardoll. So we were building um, online paper dolls, and our audience was girls um, aged like seven to twelve, roughly. Um, Isn't so there an adage about be the be the audience for your product? Yeah, yeah. Um, that that makes it easier, right? <laughs> uh, but but it also meant that you know because because that's the case, and unfortunately you didn't have that many you know twelve year old girls building online games for, for their peers. I mean, today, you probably even have that in some cases, which is amazing, but you didn't in 2005, 2006. Um, so it was also a very underserved demographic, which also made this a huge opportunity. And at some point, the company had 200 million users and like a billion, a billion daily page views when that was still a metric. Um, That's phenomenal. 
So, um, so I was I was there. I, I joined um, as an individual contributor, as we say in the industry, uh, without any kind of real, you know, job. It was more I met the CEO and it's like, okay, you should join us. And then it's like, okay, well, what can I help you with? Um, so I ended up uh, learning on the job um, action script, which is the version of JavaScript used in Flash, a technology that's um, thankfully dead by now. Um, and and eventually, eventually, um, I I got to manage the engineering team and um, learn how to do that. I suppose. Uh, but one of the one of the people on this uh, in this company um, on a consulting basis was uh, Daniel, who would eventually go on and start Spotify um, together with another co-founder. And of course, we talked about some of his ideas around that. Uh, and it wasn't even like uh, it, was, it was certainly not a, not like a as clear of a focused business plan as, as you know you would think looking back to Spotify it wasn't even like specifically about music in the beginning we, we were building a streaming service for any sort of content um, the focus of music came not much later but slightly later uh, but at some point at some point during this um, spring of 2006 uh, he asked if I wanted to join him as him and his co-founder as uh, the CTO of their company and build the tech team and the product teams and run that side of the organization. Uh, and that sounded like an, like an awesome challenge to me. So I accepted um, and joined them and uh, brought in a team. And I guess the rest is history. Yeah, indeed. Um, I really like that the two, sort of the two parts that you've raised about creating something out of nothing and finding that underserved market have but that's very strong intuition that has driven a lot of your career as it's gone. Um, that's fabulous. So if we think about Spotify and we think about other uh, entities that you've worked for, let's talk about that growth stage. So we've, we've sort of covered off the, this is the creation, this is the initial idea. Walk us through some of the, um, the opportunities through those growths. So how do you grow a team? How do you grow the technology? And how do you grow the market? If you can look at those three areas. Sure, sure. I mean, especially, I, I guess... The technology and the market kind of go hand in hand, right? But like, there's there's sort of two 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 sorts of growth that you um, battle with, um, but that also ultimately define your success, right? In a startup, one is the growth of your user base, uh, and that's that's the good side. <laughs> Obviously, that's why we're here. Um, but then the other side, which is driven by, well, should be driven by by the growth of your user base or the growth of your income. Um, is the team. Uh, I would say in venture-backed startups, often it might not be, right? First, you know, companies tend to grow their teams way before they have a lot of users, which is unfortunate. But, but you know, if, everything, if everything's done well, you're going to grow, grow the team because you have to, to serve your users. Um, so today at Spotify, during the time I was there, which was the first uh, roughly three and a half years, so today we, and then actually the statistic was true for quite a long time after that as well, we doubled our headcount about every year, so I think that's that's sort of at the at the you know upper limit of sustainable growth. A lot of startups have grown much faster than that, but I think that's very difficult while you know retaining a fairly efficient organization and and like retaining a culture. Because um, even like if you're yeah even if you're like doubling every year, that's like still quite quite rapid for a team. Um, so if we look at the startups that you're advising now, or the boards that you're sitting on, how do you provide feedback to them on that tension point between growing the user base versus growing the team? Because there's a bit of a chicken and the egg scenario. How do you capture that that lesson or that advice? No, I feel actually I feel like companies are are more more sensible about headcount growth now because I think people I think the industry has matured a little bit and the people also see the cost of of doing that too rapidly. Like even if you have the money, you kind of hire. No, there's like two, two, two parts to this actually. Like, I mean, you, hi you hire out of necessity because you, you have a job that needs to be done. Um, there's an exception, I guess, to this, which I would um, encourage companies that can afford it to make. And that is like when you, when you meet exceptional talent, I would say like bring them on board, even if you don't necessarily have a specific job for them, because you know, they, you, you'll find something valuable for them to do if you are on a growth trajectory. But um, you know, other than that, uh, if you can keep the number of people down and still like serve your customers well. That's that's an extreme um, benefit, not just in terms of, of like financial cost because you don't have as many people to pay, but but also because you can keep the organization much more focused. And there's an enormous overhead to headcount growth. 
Um, I mean, like, there's some really amazing examples of this. Like, Instagram, I think, had like 18 people when they were acquired by Facebook, and even more extreme, like WhatsApp had about 50 people serving at the time already like what 300 million users or so. I might be misremembering the numbers a little bit, but it was like that order of magnitude with 50 people. That's, yeah, it's that ratio is phenomenal. Um, and I think there's that interesting balance of uh, you know, keeping your team lean, serving your customers, um, but keeping your sanity as well. That is an interesting journey to go through. Um, if you reflect back um, through those growth journeys, what surprised you the most about that trajectory? So I guess on the team side, it's how hard, I would say, impossible it is to kind of keep, keep office politics out of it. There comes a point where, you know, however much you resist it, at some point people start maneuvering and, you know, optimizing for their own career or, you know, their own position rather than the, the company or the customers you're serving, which is unfortunate. You know, whoever figures out how to postpone that moment the longest probably has a lot of, of benefits for the organization. Um, I guess... So Spotify was a little bit of it was a little bit odd in terms of growth, right? Because we we managed our growth a lot in the early days. We could have grown a lot faster than we did. So in in the very early days after the public launch, which which happened in um, October two thousand eight, right? So more than two years after we started building the company, um, which is also very unusual and certainly not something I recommend. But this was this was. Uh, this was caused by, you know, it took a very long time to get the music licenses to do what we wanted to do because it hadn't really been done in that way before and there was a lot of resistance from inside the music industry that we had to overcome. Um, but post that, um, initially, in the very, very first, um, you know, weeks and months, we, we managed how quickly our user base could grow through an invite system, which is very common at the time, for, for technical reasons, right? We wanted to be able to scale up the platform in, in a managed way and make sure that you know, bringing on more users didn't um, didn't impact the user experience of, of the existing users. Um, but fairly, fairly, you know, fairly soon, we kind of had that under control. Uh, but we also had a lot of pressure from, from the music industry side that they, they cared a lot about making sure that the ratio of paying customers for the premium service should be like high because they, they they were always very concerned about the fact that you know from their from from their perspective we wanted to give away music for free and they didn't like it they didn't even have like real kind of a business perspective in this they they had more of like but this is art this is our creation it should be expensive um, so, so you know, we, and it, we could have we could have added like any number of, of users for the free service, but it was actually quite challenging to convert people to the paid service. And this was before we had the mobile apps, which became um, in in every way like the the driver for people to actually start paying for Spotify. Um, so this was at a time when it was almost like basically only the desktop apps, and the only thing you really got for paying was you could rid of the ads. There were a few other features you could listen to music offline, but it wasn't like any key features. Um, so it was difficult to convert people, which meant the only way we could keep the ratio of paying users up is by not adding too many free users. So you control the, the, the proportions of the, of the market you're serving. Yeah, yeah really interesting. Um, uh, there are so many different parts of that answer that I really want to dive into. I'll start at the beginning and work my way through. So you mentioned um, a startup that will see greater success as one that's able to avoid that sort of office politics and the gaming of the internal structure and system as for, delay that for as long as possible and keep eye on the prize and eye on that vision. What are some of the tips, tricks that you can recommend to the audience on, on how to do that? Um, as a leader, be very transparent. Um, you know, make sure that everyone in the organization has like all the information to the extent it's possible. Um, and part of that is just how you communicate. Uh, and and you know starting to do but another another is I guess it's all about how you communicate but one one is like what you actually say but another is to make sure that that is also um, documented in a way that's accessible and I think many many companies now are building um, very geographically distributed teams which makes everything a lot harder but it also it's like such a um, such an upside if you can if you can do it well 
because suddenly you can access a global talent pool. You can hire people. You can hire the best people you, you can get your hands on, regardless of where they happen to live in the world. Um, but then, you know, the, the the downside and I would argue upside of that is you need to be extremely uh, disciplined in how you communicate. You need to make sure everything is documented in a way that everyone can can um, can access, regardless of whether they're with you physically or, or on the other side of the world. Um, but if you do that, then uh, if you do that well, I think you'll also have everyone more on the same page, and you'll create less of these factions and these like competing interests. Fabulous. And then diving into topic around the music industry, because obviously, you know, around the room, there's going to be people who are involved in startups that are uh, trying to disrupt either major incumbents or challenge industries that have not changed fast enough for the world we're living in today. So, you know. We've We've had some, a lot of in the banking royal commission. We've had some space in healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. What, with the sort of the hindsight, it's 2020, absolutely. But looking back, what what was the catalyst, or, or how did you encourage, in some small way, to change that relationship with the consumer and the industry? I mean, it's. Um, I've said this many times. Um, so it's almost feels a bit like a cliche now, but, but uh, hope probably you haven't heard it before. Like I would say, like there's like two two online um, online music services that came out of Stockholm. Um, one of them is Spotify, which you all know of, but the other one is uh, the Pirate Bay, which <laughs> apparently also you all know of. Um, so the Pirate Bay was uh, was at the time the world's largest uh, BitTorrent tracker, so serving uh, millions of file sharers all over the world and helping them um, get access to music online. Um, and, you know, I would say if if that hadn't happened, uh, I would say probably file sharing would have happened in some other way, and there was many file sharing services before and after the Pirate Bay, but, you know, if, if file sharing hadn't happened, um, Spotify couldn't have happened. And the, the reason for that is, you know, we could capitalize on, on a user behavior that's, that was already there, but, you know, we could improve the user experience a lot and make it a lot more accessible, but more importantly, the music industry had woken up to the fact that the existing business model couldn't survive. Like There was no way that the generation that was growing up in the beginning of, um, of this century would ever buy a CD again. That was just not going to happen. And um, iTunes, the download service, was moderately successful in the US, but not much elsewhere in the world, certainly not in Northern Europe. Um, one statistic I remember from the time was that you know, on a random iPod, you would have about 98 or 99 percent of the music would be pirated, and the other like one or two percent someone had actually paid for. Um, so the music industry realized that people want to get their hands on music online. We need to figure out distribution in some other way, and then Spotify became a solution to this problem for them. Um, and the timing of that was great. Um, a few years earlier, we couldn't have done it. A few years later, someone else would have done it. Yeah. You, you became the friendly as opposed to the opposition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's phenomenal. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of times from the outside, we see the, the exponential growth and we see the success and we see the IPOs. We see um, a lot of you know, great things come out of these new platforms or startups. Um, but you don't often see the, the crisis points inside. And that's what I'd like to dive into a little bit now. Um, and maybe talk us through an experience or a moment where you questioned the, the, either the growth or the way you were building the team or you had that crisis of confidence. I would say the, the, the constant crisis of confidence with, uh, with Spotify even though for for some reason I, I guess I wasn't I was never particularly worried about it, but like the one the one constant challenge wasn't so much around the team or any of that, but that was like, are we going to get these licenses or not? And what was challenging for the team um, was that there were so many like false starts of that. There were like so many times when we thought, okay, we're launching like really launching in a month, okay, and then. Even if we've been working on it for a long time, there's like when, when you have a deadline, there are always things you want to get done before that. So then, you know, okay, the entire team is in crunch mode. We're going to work like, you know, all days and nights and weekends. And like, we're just going to get these things done in the next four weeks. And then the end of the four weeks came and everyone was really tired and worked really hard and there were no licenses signed and we couldn't launch. And then <laughs> you kind of repeat that a couple of times and that, that tends to be like stressful for the team. Um, but, you know, it's not like, I, I never, I never blamed like that side of the company that was 
doing the negotiations with the, the rights holders either because, I mean, their job was arguably the hardest. So did they uh, come to you and be like, oh, we've got the license? And you're like, no, I don't believe you this time. It's not, it's not true. <laughs> no, it was, it was quite clear when, when it was there that there were actually real signatures on, on, on the papers. Yeah. That, would have been, that would have been such a great sense of validation for the team. Like, oh, now we can actually launch. Now we can actually make this happen. Yeah. What about companies that you advise or that you sit on the boards of? What, what are the sort of common threads of those crises of confidence that you see? I would say it's like actually quite different in each company. Like each company has its own problems. I mean, but I mean like there, there are challenges that are, are common. Like everyone's actually regardless of what, what geography they're in, like hiring is a constant challenge, like finding talent. There's like, you know, either you're in a geography where there isn't like much of it or you are, but then there's a lot of other companies competing for it. So regardless of, you know, regardless of if you're in a place that doesn't have a lot of great engineers, say, or if you're in the middle of Silicon Valley, that would say it's like, roughly equally hard, because it's just more competitive where there are large talent pools. So everyone struggles with that. Um, crisis of confidence, yeah, I mean, they kind of, uh, you know, it depends. So if you're a big enterprise software company and you're really, really like betting a lot on this, this like big customer you thought you would sign and then it, like, oh, they haven't signed this month either, like not this month, and they're, they postponed the project. And, I mean, that's challenging, but it's like really different in each company depending on what you do. Like the the tease of the licenses all the time, yeah. Um, I'm. I want to make sure, firstly, that everyone's. Do we have the? Oh yeah, we've got Slido. So if you do have questions, start populating them. Start start upvoting. If there are questions that you're like, yeah, that's a corker of a one. Um, try not to stay on your phones after you've posted your questions. That's you know fireside chat, right? We, we're we're intimate. We're we're got 260, 300 of our best friends in the room tonight. Um, so. The, your your background and your experience um, you, creates this amazing microcosm of, of direction that you're able to provide to your companies. But what I'm really curious about now is the future state. So what are you seeing as uh, the most exciting technology that's coming out that we should really start to be paying attention to? Um, so that, that depends much on your like, time perspective. Uh, horizon, I guess, long term, there's, there's like only one uh, one piece of technology that matters, and that's like machine intelligence. And like once once we get to a point of like human level machine intelligence, that's the last dimension we make. Not necessarily because it wipes it all out, but because like after that point, the machines will be the ones making we become future re redundant future and inventions. Making, yeah, yeah. Well, redundant in a way, but like it'll be like like the many other tasks that we don't need to bother ourselves with anymore because you know our our machinery does it for us. Um, so, but you know, it's anyone's guess how far out that is. You know, I'm not really convinced that it's possible. I don't think there's anything unique about the sort of substrate that the human mind happens to run on. Like it's running on a goo of proteins and like fatty tissue, which could run on silicon or any, anything else. But so I'm 100% convinced it will happen at some point, but it's anyone's guess how far out. But there will be a lot of, of course, super interesting um, and valuable inventions um, and innovations that we will do prior to that. Um, I think you know the state we're in with increasing. Uh, you know, we have the EU is taking the lead on this, but we have like fast followers among many other governments in the world, and like clamping down on um, freedom of speech on the internet in many from many different directions. You know, whether it's about privacy or whether it's about intellectual property rights or whether it's about controlling hate speech. Like they're coming at us from all directions. And it's happening, um, you know, governments tend to be very slow, but on this, on this area, they've really woken up and the, the speed at which, you know, new regulation is, is thrown at us as an industry is, is worryingly um, high right now. Um, and traditionally, like we've always talked about the internet as, as um, something that routes around censorship. Um, and I think it can still do that, but probably not in its current form, because whenever there is like a centralized choke point, whether that's a business or you know a physical piece of infrastructure, there's something for um, for a government that has law enforcement and military and so forth to come at and um, and you know force into compliance. So everything we do needs to become massively more decentralized in order to to keep our freedom online and keep our ability to innovate as companies and as individuals. Um, and there's there's of course a lot of interesting technology coming out of this and like blockchain, which 
gets a lot of attention is just one of it, but there's, there's a lot of companies, teams, open source projects that are innovating in more decentralized technology, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer versions of a lot of services that we're familiar with. So I think that's, that's a very interesting um, area, both from kind of a policy perspective, but also as an investor, I think there will be a lot of valuable um, businesses built in this area that might look very different from businesses we know of, but you know, there's the opportunities there. So the, the response to that higher regulation and that clampdown will be that decentralization and the technology associated to, to enable that to happen? I think the only response that can work, I, think, I don't think the technology industry will be successful as lobbyists. I don't think we will have that influence um, over politics that the media industry or the entertainment industry has. I mean, it's much more interesting for a politician to have a photo op with an actor or a publisher than you know with some geeky software developer from yeah it's it's really interesting seeing the the government focus on tech industry both you know in EU in the states in Australia and suddenly tech industry is like oh wait wait I don't know if uh, 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 wait what are you asking what are you why are you asking that um, so the the there's there's a couple of outcomes to that right there's the new technology and advances in technology and then there's new business models. Um, do you want to talk a bit more about the business model side of things? Um, I think, so the business models, I think, are the ones that are the least clear now, but I, I, I think that doesn't mean that they won't be there, it just means we need to figure them out. If you go back to, you know, the mid-90s, when, uh, when you had the free software movement and open source kind of getting, getting into the mainstream attention space a little bit, and like, was, like kind of, graduated from something that happened in um, you know, university departments or hacker basements um, into something that like, like industry was starting to embrace or, or starting to fight. Um, no, one, no, no one knew how to make money off of open source software that you could just, that you were just giving away for free, right? But then eventually people figured out and like great businesses were built on top of it. You know, out of Sweden we had MySQL, the database company, and you, know, you had companies like Red Hat and uh, you know, hundreds of others well-known companies by now uh, that all figured out how to make money off of um, software that everyone can download for free, access to source code, fork, change, and you know, the whole field of common space peer production has produced um, huge valuable artifacts, whether it's you know, the Linux operating system, Apache web server, or like all of Wikipedia that we use every day. Um, and a lot of businesses have been built on top of it that we didn't understand how to do in the 90s. I think similarly, a more decentralized internet will mean a lot of the current business models won't work, but I'm 100% I'm convinced we can, we will figure out other ones. We won't know them in advance. We'll have to experiment and like many things will fail, but others will succeed. Do you see that resulting in a change to the sort of monolithic tech giants that we're seeing now? So the decentralization of the internet changing that dynamic of the big massive Facebooks and the Alphabets and et cetera, Googles? Um, probably, but probably others that are even bigger will build on top of them. And like, if again, if you if you like look back to the '90s or the early 2000s, and you know, and, and no one thought we would ever unseat Microsoft. Um, and I guess if you look at Microsoft today, it's an even bigger company than it was, but it's strategically completely unimportant. Uh, and now we have other giants: Amazon, <laughs> Facebook, Google, etc. Um, and no one can kind of think how how we could ever replace them, and we probably won't, right? We probably won't have a search engine that outcompetes Google or a social network that outcompetes Facebook, but we'll have something else that we don't know of yet, which will become even bigger. Yeah. I like that the thinking of, you know, creation isn't about that mimicry, it's about something brand new, it's about disrupting the, the norm or the relationship that we had that, with that information or that data. What do you see as a role of government in this journey? So you've mentioned regulation already, which is sort of a pretty hot topic most of the time. What, where, how do you see governments evolving to respond to decentralized internet? Um, well, I, ideally they don't. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're the cause of all these problems, right? Um, no, but like, I mean, I mean, I don't want to offend anyone. I know we're in a space that's at least in some some form funded by the government, and I mean, that's that's great for all the companies that can use it, etc. But you know, and, and it's perhaps not so great for the taxpayers who paid for it. I don't know, but but it's um, uh, fundamentally like you get this question often, like, oh, what can we do as a government for startups? And 
You know, there's a lot of things you can do, but most of them involve like not getting in the way. Um, you know, whether that is like preventing me from hiring someone just because they don't live in the same country and I want to bring them here, or you know, whether it it means um, requiring me to get a bunch of licenses to do whatever I want to do. It's like all of those things get in the way of businesses growing, and I'd rather they stop do those than trying to throw money at projects. Yeah, excellent. Um, and then if you look at the future state of a founder or a co-founder, what do you see? What's that persona like? Someone that uh, has an insight that is not commonly understood yet. It's so like some, something new that people in general either haven't thought of or you know definitely think can't work. Um, that he or she is, of course, also right about, but that you don't know in advance, right? Um, and and then you know has has like the ability, the skill set, but like perhaps most important, like the tenacity, the drive to pursue that and fight off all the obstacles that will certainly be in his or her way along the road. And like you know, when everyone else thinks you're going to lose, you still believe that you're going to win, and you keep fighting for it. Yeah, and dogged persistence. Yeah. Um, I might open it up to Slido questions, if that's all right. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm uh, Sarah. I'm Communications Director at Antler, and I'm going to be reading some of the Slido questions that you've sent through. So uh, one of the most popular ones for you, Andreas, that's come through is that there's a number of uh, very successful Swedish tech startups. What, if any, is unique about the Swedish ecosystem that creates so much success? Um, so for, first, first off, I don't think it's unique, right? Because you have other ecosystems that create much more success. Um, but I guess like number of companies or unicorns uh, to use one metric per capita is is fairly high um, in Europe um, for Sweden. Um, and I think there's just you know it's, it's an anyone's guess, um, but I think a, a couple of factors that have played into this is um, Swedes. Scandinavians in general um, have always, as in you know, for the last hundred plus years, been early adopters of, of new forms of communications technology. Um, you know, you had like phone penetration was very high uh, at an early, you know, in the whenever that was like mid mid twentieth century, and uh, mobile phone penetration was very high at an, at an early stage, and and so on, right? So they, we've always adopted these new technologies faster, I guess, than the world at large, uh, and whether that is because it's a sparsely populated country where people are far apart, or a country where it's like cold most of the year and you'd rather not go out, or <laughs> just because you know we, as a culture, we're like rather introverts, so we don't really like. You know, it's just nicer to talk to someone over the phone than actually having to. I need some physical to distance away. Face to face, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, if you if you board a bus in Stockholm and like, if there's if there's any. Any way you could sit, like not next to someone, it's extremely weird if you go and sit next to a person. Like, if it's if it's full, then that's okay. But you would never sit next to someone if there is a free seat. Um, yeah. Um, so you know, I don't know if it's like any of those factors. Maybe like drive people to, to start using these technologies early, which means there is a market for you know building other businesses on top of, of this. Um, it, it is it is a country where like. Uh, Reasonably strong engineering tradition, and like re reasonably good universities within that, and a culture that's been building things. Um, it could also be just because you know some random factors have caused some early successes, and and that that is like a really important part in in getting like a startup ecosystem going. You need to have if you have a, if you have a couple of big successes, you both demonstrate. Um, you know, the, the value of this is a career path. It makes it easier for people to justify it to go join a startup or start a company rather than going on a more traditional career path of joining a big bank or a consultancy or whatever it might be, right? Um, it also creates, it also validates venture capital as an asset class, which makes it easier for funds to raise more money and, and fund these companies. Um, and uh, it, you know, if you have successes with big exits, um, that also tends to disperse capital among a lot of early employees uh, that then go on and start new companies or become angel investors and invest in other companies and understand what it takes to get a startup going, perhaps more than 
an investor that made money through another industry, right? If you're a real estate, if you made some successful real estate investments and then you start backing a couple of startups, you might have other expectations on them than if you made money through another tech venture. So there's, there's a couple of those things that might be cultural, a couple that might be just random luck, creating some early successes that then you know get an ecosystem going. And I think probably people reflecting the crowd, we're at a stage in the Australian ecosystem where we're starting to see that the, you know, the evolution of the unicorns um, and that ecosystem start to feed back as well, which I think are really powerful. We just need it to be colder apparently and be more antisocial. <laughs> Noted. Um, we might go on to the next question. At what point does a flat structure stop being effective and when should job titles, roles and progression come in? Um, I guess as late as possible, but not too late. <laughs> no, but I mean, you have, you have, it's a kind of a common disease among some startups that, you know, you have a lot of people that are kind of more interested in playing company or playing office than like building the product and talking to customers. And it's like a lot of important, like, you know, spend a lot of time on like the org chart and like, oh, what's like, what's my title? And, you know, I mean, I mean some of it is like when you're hiring people as an early company that no one has heard of, like the, one of the few things you have to compete with is like you can give someone a big title. Like you can be like CXO. Uh, you won't actually have anyone reporting to you, but like, yeah. <laughs> um, We're actually all C something O's. Right, yeah. right. Um, so you have you obviously have title inflation, but um, but yeah, I mean, there's a reason why you have uh, structure and hierarchies, and it's a way of managing things. But it also comes with a lot of overhead. So. Um, it, the better people you hire, the more they will also self-manage, um, which is great because then you can postpone some of this. Uh, and the clearer your direction is as a company, like what problem you're solving, it's also easier for people to manage themselves because it's it's more obvious to anyone what they should be doing. So like clarity can help a lot. Really good teams can help a lot. So keep it flat, keep it clear. Yeah. Um, we might actually throw it open to a question for the crowd, if anyone has got a burning one. We've got one in the back. Oh, run, Sarah, run. So to repeat that for anyone who might not have heard, how did why, why did Spotify win over Pandora? So no, I mean Pandora. Pandora was a great service and still is. Um, it wasn't really. It, it didn't really solve the same problem as Spotify. So Pandora, for those who don't know, was uh, essentially like a personalized radio service that would recommend you. It would create like a personalized radio channel for you based on some initial songs. So you could tell it like, I want to listen to roughly this music, or you know, you could tell them some specific artists and songs, and then they would create a channel for you. And then whenever there was a new song, you could say thumbs up or thumbs down, um, and that would influence how they kept recommending music for you on that channel. Uh, what you couldn't do is say, I want to listen to this album, or I want to listen to. Um, you know, I want to create this playlist of songs. So it wasn't on demand uh, in that sense. Uh, and therefore, uh, the music industry weren't, didn't, were, they didn't, they didn't feel as threatened by it because there was still a reason for people to buy music on CD or download music on iTunes or other download services or, I guess, get it from the file sharing networks. But but you know, just having Pandora wouldn't replace all your music needs because often you want to listen to some specific music, not just general recommendations. Um, so Spotify's uh, offer was much bigger. Um, in in principle, we could also do what Pandora was doing, and we did have a radio feature, but it was for the longest of times really, really bad, and we knew it. It was embarrassingly bad. Um, Spotify you still launched it. Yeah, um, Spotify didn't invest in recommendations until much later. When it did, it did so really well. And like now, now I think that's like a key differentiator for the service. When there are many other on-demand streaming services, I would say Spotify is leading on recommendations. Um, but what happened with Pandora 
It was also commercially very different. So because it wasn't on demand, because it was more like a radio, they didn't even need to talk to the record labels to get a license. They could use um, a mandatory licensing scheme in the US, which was essentially the same as a radio station would use. So they, there was like a there was like a sort of upfront, well-defined fee that they had to pay, and they paid it, and they made their business work on top of that. And then that type of licensing system doesn't exist in that same way outside of the US, which is why at some point when they got to a certain size and the music industry um, started questioning some of what they were doing, they had to shut down everything outside of the US. So that's why they left Australia. Um, so they weren't really solving the same problem and they didn't have anywhere near the same commercial and legal setup that Spotify and subsequent on-demand streaming services had. Great. Other questions from the audience? Oh, got it's not on. Thank you. Uh, Andreas? Sorry. Previously, you mentioned um, about timing, and uh, you know, too early, you would not have succeeded. Too late, somebody else would have done it. I, I think timing is, you know, you can look at YouTube and lots of people who actually just kind of navigated that timing right, and with you know, burgeoning technologies right now with AI and things like that, uh, trying to get that timing right and navigating that. I think is going to be a challenge for anyone. What was the the process that you guys went through and the pivots or whatever that you did to actually try to get that timing right um, through that process? Mm, so I, I don't think I don't think that's ever how it works, right? I don't think you can get timing right, and there was nothing we did specifically, right? I think from from our perspective, we launched a year and a half later than we should have. The original goal was always to launch in six months from when we started out. Um, and the product was ready enough to do that, but we didn't have the music licenses, so we couldn't, and it was delayed another 20 months. Um, so I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's any company that has been trying to then wait it out. <laughs> That's not how it works. Uh, rather, you have companies that might have been too early with something, and too early usually means that either the technology wasn't mature enough or was too expensive to make the business model work. So. You know, you run out of money in some way, or it just doesn't you just doesn't really get it to work, right? And then you die. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't think you ever have the situation where you try to wait for the right timing. You you try, you give it, you give it all you can, and then you might fail anyway because of timing. Um, but the one company that ultimately succeeds with the timing is the one that did it like almost, but not quite too early. So you do it when it was still very, very hard almost seemed impossible to everyone else, but you just managed to do it and then it takes off. And then a few years later, it would have been much easier to do exactly the same thing, but had you waited, someone else would have done it before you. No, 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 it did. well, okay, so this was a very brief period. Um, it started, like the original idea was a streaming service, but not specifically for music. Like the main, the main focus in our thinking initially was video, and when we started building, we built the initially um, a content agnostic streaming system. Very soon, the focus on music was quite clear. And probably through that journey, that testing journey, you're able you're able to refine what content was actually going to be appropriate, not just a ubiquitous platform. I mean, yeah, that was mostly like I mean, I guess some part of it was like, yeah, it's like harder to stream to stream video, but like that that's a tractable problem that we could have solved. It, the main reason was like a, a realization that okay, it's probably going to be really hard to get these licenses for music, but entirely impossible to do the same for video, which I guess um, is proven correct by. The fact that still today, 13 years later, no one has been able to build like a proper Spotify for video. You have Netflix and you have a bunch of other streaming services, but content is fragmented. You don't have any one service that you can go to to get all your video that you would want to watch. Interesting challenge for the crowd. Um, can we grab one more Slido question, actually? We'll do a Slido question. Microphone, it's a bit dodgy today. If you had to invest in a startup right now, what area, what product, and why? 
I mean, it depends. Is depends. someone about to stop pitching? Yeah. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> right, all right. So, you know, so free, free business ideas. Here you go. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, so a company I would like, uh, I would want to exist. Um, and, you know, that I also think would be a good business is, so I mentioned, I mentioned um, a while ago the power of like geographically distributed teams um, and the ability to hire everywhere. And some companies are doing this. And one of the big challenges with this um, outside of your communications overhead and all of that is um, just the administrative work of paying taxes, following labor laws, um, providing benefits, making you know people part of a stock option program in, let's say, 20 different countries all over the world, while you're still too small to even have a legal team. Um, so anyone who addresses this with software and helps me hire people in any country and still pay them, uh, still make them part of the benefit packages we want to offer, still make them part of option, stock options program, I think they, they solve a really important problem. I think there would be a lot of paying customers for this company. Free idea for you. Um, we'll get another question from the crowd. The one at the back. Maybe, are there any, maybe we could get some diversity in? Yeah. Hi there, Andreas. Thank you very much for this evening. Um, as a venture partner at Angela, um, what's the importance of this role to you and how are you helping entrepreneurs through this program? So one, one part of it is uh, I'm, I'm on the investment committees, um, you know, so the, the group that makes the final decision for the teams that have been through the first two months or so of the program, whether we will invest in them and um, they will continue to the latter half of the program. So I guess there my role is to ask them really hard questions and be really annoying. You get um, to be me. That's good. Right. But before, but before and after that, I also help coach the teams. Um, so, you know, on a more, on a more friendly note. Um, and so it is pertinent to say, you know, Antler are hiring at the moment for that cohort, so bringing that first cohort, recruiting that first cohort in, um, two month uh, initial period of creating teams, creating the great ideas, a really sort of structured, engaging, fast program to sort of speed up that process with people like Andreas providing side-by-side -side feedback and, and response and then that investment committee point at the two-month mark. So um, if you are interested and you have a great idea but you're not quite sure how to find the team or how to get capital or how to get the commitment, come chat to one of the Antler people. Um, we'll do another Slido question, please. This is one of the most popular tonight. What is most overhyped tech right now? Right, it's uh, it's so so easy to say like blockchain or machine learning or something, right? But like I think all of those, you know, th there's there's a little bit of like negativity in the question too, right? Like you know why why bother that it's it's, it's overhyped, right? What's it, like the correctly hyped tech, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, no, no, but it's uh, it's it's quite natural that that you see this in the industry. You have, um, but but much much of this is. Um, people that are kind of tacking on buzzwords to their slide decks because they think that increases their chance of, of getting funding. Um, you know, a few years ago, you saw a lot of slide decks where it was, it felt like they'd, they'd like repurpose their previous slide deck, they just then like search, replace big data, machine learning. Um, and uh, and you know, often there's like little thought going into like, okay, how do you, why, why, why is this actually a useful technology for, for um, for my company. So I think in general, um, in our industry, there's like a little bit too much focus on a, a, like some specific technologies that you want to use and less focus on what, what is actually the problem you're solving for your customers and why is this big enough a market for them? And then, you know, once, once you've kind of sold your investors on, on the fact that this is a huge problem that people are really willing to pay for um, and you're well positioned based on your experience and skill set to, to solve this for them, then that's the right time to go into like more details of, okay, you know, we're solving this problem by using technology XYZ and that's fine. Um, but a lot of people start out with, you know, we're going to put insurance on the blockchain rather than, oh, there's a lot of people that are not really well served by the existing insurance providers. 
That was a, that was a beautiful non-answer answer. Of the, <laughs> the most overhyped tech is the tech you don't need for your problem space and for your market and for your user. Yeah, we'll do another slide question. Can you tell us a bit about your failures, if you've had any, so we can learn from them? Oh, I'm sorry, who's famous? Can you tell failures. us a bit about your failures, if you've had any, so we can learn from them? Mm. Or you can tell us about famous sure. people as well. Sure. No, no, failures. Um, no, I mean, the company, the company I started uh, after Spotify, is uh, there's a lot of interesting learning experience from that. I think the biggest takeaway for me was... Um, so we talk, we talk in our industry about, um, you know, you're going to go to market with a minimum viable product, and then we're going to iterate until we have product market fit, and then we're going to invest in growth, and then everything will be great. And that's, that's the sort of conceptual startup story. Um, and that's, that's great, but each of those steps tend to be a lot more complicated in the real world than they look in the textbook. Um, so I'll, I don't want to go into too much detail of a company that you're completely uninterested in, but the company we started, uh, which was called Rap, we were one of the many companies at the time, this was 2011, that were trying to solve the problem of um, using mobile phones for performance-based customer acquisition for bricks and mortar retailers. Um, kind of what would come after Groupon to solve this problem for, for retailers. Um, and we did it in a specific way that initially seemed very successful and was extremely viral. And you know, in the first somewhere between like three and six months, we got 10% of the entire population in Sweden, which was our launch market, um, as our active users. So like every every like one out of 10 people were using our service with like no investment in paid advertising. And you know, after a very brief period, because we're just spreading virally from one user to the other. And this this would seem like you know, if this isn't product fit, market fit, then what is, right? Um, and a lot of retailers were interested in working with us. And um, it turns out after a while that we weren't able to sustain this and we couldn't kind of overbridge the gap between, you know, how much would a retailer spend on marketing themselves with our platform versus, you know, what sort of like how good would the offers be that our users got that actually ultimately like enticed them to use this platform and share it with their friends. So. The learning from this is, you know, you can have like false positives when you try to identify your product market fit. Um, and like, just because something grows really fast doesn't necessarily mean that um, that you can sustain it. Like, you kind of have to understand why does it grow and can I keep fueling the fire in a sustainable way? Um, other examples of this in a much bigger uh, way is like e-commerce companies that. Um, have customer acquisition costs that like vastly outweigh their lifetime value of a user to just acquiring users with a lot of paid advertising and then they never sell enough to recover that cost and that works until they're out of venture funding and then suddenly it doesn't work. I think it's a really great point. Even when things are going well, be critical, be thoughtful of what those metrics actually mean and what that traction actually looks like. So don't just take all the, the good with a smile. Um, be thoughtful about it as well. Um, can we we'll go over here? Ranya? And we'll have one more question after this question. If you're working on a hobby project that might one day turn into something that could be commercial, commercially viable, how would you go into that hobby project with that in mind? I want to create it for myself. Could I create it for myself in a way that if I decide to take a commercial, I could? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's uh, that's actually a good way to get started, right? Like if you have. You know, if you if you're kind of scratching your own itch, right? Then chances, like, what what you need to think about is like how how common of a problem is this, like, and how how big of a problem is it? Um, and not every business needs to be a startup either. Like, I mean, there's a lot of definitions of startups, but the one that I think has the most meaning is that startups are all about growth, and, and that's why venture capital as an asset class makes sense, and why it makes sense to invest in startups because you know you bet on them growing extremely fast into massive businesses. Um, there's a lot of interesting problems to solve for yourself and for other people that don't necessarily have the potential to grow into you know, 100 million, a billion dollar companies. Um, that doesn't mean they're not worth spending your time on. Um, so I would say, you know, 
it's perfectly fine to have a hobby project or a side business that solves a problem that's interesting for you and perhaps a few other people. But if you really want to turn this into a startup, then you also need to um, to be confident that this is big enough of a problem for a big enough market um, that is willing to pay to get this problem solved. Um, then, of course, you also need to figure out how you solve it. But Oh, actually, so we might keep on going to the next question. If that's okay. okay, take it afterwards. <laughs> He'll be around. <laughs> hey, thank you very much for visiting us in Sydney, by the way. Um, I've got more of a tech question, because you are a CTO. And you, you spoke earlier to um, documenting or um, you know, basically the, to scale the distribution of information. So I, as CTO, how much of your kind of, what I would call your product domain, your customer facing, but how much work did you have to do in your business domain in terms of running the processes behind the, the you know, everything from licensing, all that stuff that allows you to scale essentially the systems. I'm a big fan of domain modeling. Do you speak to it? I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part. Here. I'm a big fan of domain modeling, as in oh, sure. talking, okay. talking, okay. not necessarily, you know, but a general kind of domain modeling, not necessarily right. being uh, overly, yeah. uh, what's the word? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I haven't, I haven't done any, anything like as formal as that, but you know, certainly, uh, you know, as a CTO, and especially if you're kind of early with the company and you work very closely with founders, you, um, or if you are a founder, um, you, you get involved into every aspect of the business, you know, whether it is, okay, does this, does this clause in the licenses, if you take a Spotify example, work? Like, can we actually fulfill this? Will it have, will it have like too much of an impact on the user experience? Um, or, you know, if you're working, like the company I started afterwards, at some point we, we needed to, um, we needed to handle credit card numbers for our users and, you know, we needed to become PCI compliant and, you know, even though that's, it's like a compliance work as CTO, you get very involved into like, okay, can we actually follow all of these processes and how do we do that and who's responsible? So yeah, I mean, certainly you get entangled into all, all parts of it. Um, I don't know if it answers your question, but it's, it's definitely the case. It's not something you can really simply, like realistically avoid. Um, I think it depends a little bit, like in, in, you know, in a company like, in a consumer company like Spotify, like the customers are in the millions, so you're never really facing any, any one of them. Um, Especially it, not the Swedish. But <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, no, even though I do encourage everyone, like on every level, to actually do go go and work in customer support every now and then, and like you know do do like solid tickets. That's that's really everyone should do that. Everyone should understand. Whereas if you're building like enterprise software, then you know if you're selling to really big companies, then you know the CTO will probably come on a lot of the sales meetings. So. I think every. Yeah. So. Yeah, but Sorry. I don't think I don't think you can quantify it that much. It's also going to be different for every week. Some weeks you spend all the time with the legal team, and other weeks you just work with your tech people. So it's it's not quantifiable that that way. But there's a good message there about everyone on the team should have some level of customer empathy, right? Should be in that role at least a little bit to, to be able to speak to those those pain points and to take speak to those issues. Apparently, we've got one more Slido. Okay. I think this is a really insightful question when uh, an executive or someone like yourself, Andreas, is asked it because it gives you a little bit of background into how the person thinks and what they value. So based on that, what's one book that you would recommend and why? <laughs> Just a curveball for you to end the evening. Yeah. Um. I was going to say, like, what's one song you recommend and why? <laughs> That'd be more appropriate. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 honestly, I think a lot of, like, business books are... Um, the informa information density tends to be very low. And I think the reason for this is, you know, you can't, uh, you can't get famous or go on a tour or make any money off of, like, a blog post. But often the content of the business books are you know 
a blog post's worth that have then been expanded to book length because that's how the industry works and that's like the only artifact that the publishing industry can handle. So I would say, you know, certainly um, read the books, but if your time is limited and whose isn't, um, you can probably read the blogs of the same people and get more, more like information per unit of time. Do you have a favorite author or thought leader that you recommend to the crowd? Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, people like Reid Hoffman, um, you know, like you can read his split scaling book, but you can also just listen to the, uh, to the Greylock podcast with him or, you know, read a lot of the blogs written or you can, you know, someone like Andrew Chen at Andreessen Horowitz is worth following or there's a, there's a bunch of them, but, but I don't know, I think you need my recommendations for this. They're like very easy to find and you'll make your own judgment on on whose advice appeals to you. Great. Well, this set certainly has not been lacking in information density, that's for sure. Um, before we wrap up, just a couple of call to action. Make sure you check out all the events that are going on at Fishburners. Make sure you check out University at uh, University City of Sydney and the Visiting Entrepreneur Program. Um, and make sure you check out Antler and do apply as the first inaugural co cohort. I'm going to pass over to Ant very quickly. Sit yeah. down. Don't, don't, go, don't leave yet. This you is the best bit. No. Uh, I just want to say on behalf of Antler and City of Sydney and Fishburners, thank you, Andreas. I know that you, um, it's a big trip for you to make out here for a few days, and we've um, put you through quite a lot of events, so you're probably absolutely exhausted. Um, so thank you for spending this time with such an amazing community. Thank you. Um, and as, as Antler continues to bring out entrepreneurs that come in to help the cohort provide that advice, we'll also make sure that we share these people with you guys and host a lot more events and make it accessible to everyone. Um, I think there's been enough Antler plugs tonight that I probably don't need to do any more other than say, if you are interested, look on the website. There's information sessions. Um, and we'd love to meet as many of the aspiring founders as we can over the next few months. And we're going to show Andreas some non-Swedish hospitality. We're going to go to Ryan's Bar on George Street after this for more mingling, more chatting. Um, but uh, until then, big round of applause for Andreas. Thank you. Big thank you to everyone for making it out tonight. Uh, do come join us and feel free to fl uh, flood the stage now to make it feel like a rock star. Oh, and there's pizza.